go from the suffragists and the bicycle to we have some modern day suffragists that went on a bicycle ride today. Um, a suffragist social ride. We have a few of the ride marshals. Um, you guys went out of order on me. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Should I sit here? It's fine. Okay, it's fine. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm a curator, I'm a control freak. Um, so, our, our, we went, you all went on a, a few of you, raise your hands. Who in the, we can't see in the audience, but a bunch of you went on the suffragist social ride. Did you have a good time? Great. Thank you for doing that. And you went along a few of the rides. It was um, Leah was our ride marshal, and we had some great, and Renee as well. And, and Nellie, Nellie, of was course. A huge help too. But we had some great props for you guys, and you staged a few historic photos <laughs> along Alice Paul's route, um, the uh, 1903, 1913 March for Women's Votes for Women. You were all wearing your buttons almost. We have to get everybody's buttons. <laughs> um, and so we're going to have some great pics up on Instagram and all of those great things. But that leads me to, and, I, and that's why the order was important, folks, but that leads me to, um, that was the 1890s. You know, and I don't know if, for those of you who went on the ride, the sort of weight of that history and time and the fact that you were all, a bunch of you were wearing bloomers, which were verboten in some ways. Um, <laughs> there. <laughs> um, so that's what brings me to wanting to talk to Lynn. Earlier today, we screened, uh, did three screenings of the film Vajja. How many of you know the film? It's about a Saudi Arabian girl, she's about 10, 11 years old, who dreams of owning a bicycle. And she's so desperate that she enters a Quran recitation contest to um, be able to, and this is a still from the film, mm -hmm. to be able to win the prize money to win her coveted bicycle. And that was, that's, that's the conversation and the trajectory. We're talking about 1896, Susan B. Anthony's talk about the bicycle empowering women, and here we are in 2016, 120 years later, and we still have women who are just now experiencing the freedom mm -hmm. of mobility and independence in parts of the world. So Lynn, um, you're not necessarily one of the bicycling mm -hmm. um, leaders in our communities, mm -hmm. and you, you probably looked at me a little weird <laughs> when I invited <laughs> you to this panel, but it has a reason. And we, Absolutely. of course, have the exhibition, She Who Tells yes. a Story, women photographers from Iran and the Arab world on view. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if perhaps you can talk a little bit about the social and cultural mm -hmm. issues that the film touches upon. Of course. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Lori, with a great group of panelists. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, the film is set in Saudi Arabia, and I'm going to try to talk about that, but also about the entire Middle East. And while a lot of societies are now trying to put more people on bikes and, you know, looking at urban safety and how, you know, we can do that, uh, the Middle East is still grappling with a lot of social and cultural taboos with regards to women on bikes. So uh, this is still very much challenged by all sorts of codes. Um, behavior codes, dress codes, all for women to remain virtuous so that they make good wives. Um, to Sue's point earlier, so a lot it's still of, going absolutely. on. Absolutely. And um, a lot of those social taboos have to do with, um, you know, how, uh, you know, they, women would show too much of, uh, the woman would show too much of her body if she's sitting on the bike. Um, uh, the fact that once on her bike and off she goes, she is like in touch with the sun and the wind and this you know, feeling of empowerment and this awakens in her feelings of joy and freedom, all the things that Bad need news. to remain suppressed so that she remains also subdued. But also we've heard a lot of clerics in the Middle East talk about uh, the position that she has on her bike, so a lot of synergies here, and the fact that she, you know, it will damage her reproductive system, or that she, God forbid, would lose her virginity. And in those sort of more conservative, very conservative societies, this is linked to honor. 
So all of those social uh, taboos, also it, you know, the, the bicycle, because the woman gets on it and goes on by herself, and it's difficult to take somebody with you, mm -hmm. sort of it breaks a chaperoning system mm -hmm. that is embedded in those societies, that is deeply embedded. So that was another... You, uh, you and I also, you talked about something I hadn't really thought about, but um, in terms of the built environment, mm -hmm and systems of control. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about sure, that? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, so there are two things here. There is the, the, the concept of a public space that you actually use to go out to bike, to have fun, or to just train, practice. So public space in the Middle East is, um, you know, controlled, surveilled, sometimes inaccessible. Uh, the way you use public space is not often a given, like you, you know, sometimes it's difficult to congregate. Uh, so it's not as easy just to go out and use your bike anywhere in the city. So that's one aspect, which is the public space. Now, if you look at our built environment in, in the Middle East, you have the new cities emerging in the Gulf, and that model, is um, largely around um, big malls, high rises, sort of cities, media city, education city, etc. And they're connected by large highways that are not necessarily very friendly for um, pedestrians or people on their bikes. So that makes it uh, quite tricky to use your bike as a mode of transport. Now, looking at other uh, types of uh, environments like older cities like Beirut, Cairo, Damascus, where you have this center and the ability to navigate it in this way, um, you know, th those cities have, beyond the social and cultural taboos that I've spoken about, have gone through a, a rise in demographics the past 20 years that has not been accompanied by a thinking of the infrastructure and how to deal with this and how would people navigate it. Well, this Another, is happening in this yes. country, which we'll get Nelly to talk more about later as well. Yes, yes. <laughs> but but the I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to say, but, but, but another layer are, is the awareness raising on how to deal with somebody on, on, on a bike, Again, which Again, Nelly and, and, the et, et and the traffic laws. There, yes. there are traffic laws, but the way they're implemented is not is a bit loose, and there are lots of soft processes. <laughs> so, like if we're in a car, you and I, you know, it's crowded. I look in your eyes, you look in my eyes. A lot of the traffic laws are in people's <laughs> eyes. <That's, laughs> you know, that's not <laughs> ideal when you're on a bike. <laughs> You know, anyway, driving, driving in Cairo or, you know, yeah, there is like a lot of... Riding um, in D.C., though. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that, uh, that is a, another layer to the fact that, you know, riding a bike is, you know, there are no traffic lanes, bike lanes. So that's a good segue because you brought a clip that maybe Dan can help us transition yes. to because mm -hmm. you're talking about, in this case, Syrian refugees who are moving to Berlin. When you talk about cities and infrastructure and how to figure out how to just yes. simply navigate. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll see if we can click onto our link there. Yes. This is about a one minute clip. How did you find this? <laughs> I, I was, was fascinated cool. when it was on social media a couple of, uh, uh, it was two, three months ago in January, and it just shows the mindset of the woman and how powerful the bicycle is to integrate her in this environment. I mean, just to say, as we get this... Oh, hey. Not now. Oh, hey, didn't I, do just as, it. <laughs> until we it's get this, yeah, sure. I, I think yeah. I what I would say is that, you know, this is a Syrian refugee woman trying to learn how to ride a bike. She she's in Berlin, and uh, uh, there are some NGOs who are using the bike to foster friendships and to help those women integrate a new environment. And just think of the power of the bicycle for this woman, who. Not only, you know, she doesn't have any papers, so, you know, getting a driver's license is not something in the near possible in the near future. She also does not know the language, so navigating the local mm -hmm. transportation system is right. not easy. So a bike, you know, makes your world her, bigger yes. and more accessible. Absolutely. Do we think we might get there? Do we want to? Maybe. 
check my contact. <laughs> so did, um, on the suffragists who took our ride today, did anyone um, point and gape, or was it just another day in D.C.? <laughs> yes. An officer said, is this a women's convention? <laughs> yes, <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there was a police convention going on. There was also that, yeah. yes. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. that makes sense. Well, maybe we can move on to the other clip if we're not gonna see this one. I think you described that one pretty well. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, can I fast forward to the second? Yeah, I'll pull it up in just a second. Okay. And wanna set that so, one up for us a little bit? Uh-huh, so. Because I um, didn't mention that earlier. Yes, um, so the um, Afghanistan, yes, uh, the, yes the, the cycling team where I would like to share a, a short video on the women's cycling team from Afghanistan who are up for a Nobel, Nobel Peace, Peace Prize. Prize. And this short movie was uh, shot, I, uh, this documentary was done in 2013 or 2014, so two years ago. Okay. Here we go. I, I will share that. نفس روز افغانستان نفس در حال تغییر است زنان افغانستان مخصوصا در حال تغییر هستند و این امید افغانستان است ما فکر می کنم که نیمه از پیکر جامعه افغانی را دختر را تشکیل دادند بنان معلوم است که در تمام هر ها باید نقش فعال خود را داشته باشد و امروز بدون موجودیت خانم ها فکر می کنم که هیچ چیز امکان پذیر نیست the situation for, for women in Afghanistan is still very difficult, but it has improved a lot since 2001. And it's happened because of Afghan women. It's happened because of brave women who've done brave things. خان میکنم سر خودم. من یک بسکجان هستم. بسا با افتخار من بسکج میدوانم. بعض وقتا که سوار میشم به تو فکر میکنم که اصلا من در بسکل نباشم. یک جای دیگر به تو سر خودم تا باورم نمیه که ما بسکل دوانی رو یاد گرفتیم. دخترها پرواز خواهد کردم. ایوازی که من میترسم. ایوازی که در سرک ندارم در هوا را ندارم. <laughs> Afghanistan <laughs> 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 A woman riding a bicycle is, is probably seen not only as, as being dangerous from a security perspective, but, but also being, being somehow immoral because it's sort of revealing and the, the woman sitting in a bicycle seat. So, Lynn, thank you for sharing that. Um, look at you guys being so good sitting in the <laughs> right. Well, now I know where I'm going. Um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I really absolutely. appreciate your finding that. And um, I, that bringing it back to the bicycle as an agent for change is pretty yes. tremendous. Um, mm -hmm. We want to keep the positive note. Uh, the team 
has had some issues, sadly, corruption, um, and, and for the moment their U.S. sponsors have cut things off, um, mm -hmm. is what I know, because mm -hmm. uh, their manager was selling their $3,500 giant bikes. Yeah. Um, <gasps> yeah, not good news, but it's something for everyone to keep your eyes and ears out for. Um, Absolutely, and there are many more positive stories coming out of the Middle East, and the way this is going is increasingly as an agent of change, but also as a sport. Yes. So both society is trying to embrace this more as a sport, and cities are trying to respond with uh, places for people to train and practice. So. And we showed a few, I don't know if um, a lot of you got to see the loop before, but I tried to capture a lot of the spirit of women on bicycles globally. Um, uh, it, there are so many different cycling teams mm -hmm. and, um, and the bicycle being that sort of mode of mobility and independence across the globe. Um, but I want to bring it back to DC. And we're going to transition over to um, Renee Moore and Leah Sermetis. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Sermetis, yeah. Sermetis. Um, and both of you have, in a sort of grassroots way, started to get people on bicycles that perhaps have not been on bicycles before. And I'm going to actually start with Renee. And I found a photo of you. <laughs> <laughs> this is like how we can, um, yeah. No. <laughs> Embarrass every, but <laughs> you have a rock and ride, though. I do. It's I a love sweet that bike. bike. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good looking bike. So tell us a little bit about how you came to bicycling in the, and the city, and what the motivation is and what it is. And I have a few slides that I, I can spin through. Okay. Well, I came to it, it's kind of an interesting story that involves actually um, women in bicycles and black women bike at the same time. <laughs> um, I have another group called Sassy Sisters Cycling, and they're basically riders who just kind of ride out to nowhere, turn around, come back. And Black Women Bike was hosting a workshop on biking at night in, in the street. And I put it on my site, but I had no intention of doing that. I thought, why would anybody ride at night, and why would you ride in the street? That's just crazy, <laughs> when there's all these trails. <laughs> so I went, and I remember, I was sitting in the back, my arms were folded across my chest, and I was like, I'm never doing that, that's just crazy. And, you, and then you're they, a nuclear <laughs> scientist. Right? Yeah, I have yeah. a, yeah, I do, yeah, I'm a yeah. chemist, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they hosted it again, and this time I got tricked. They actually had a ride afterwards. Uh -huh. And I didn't bring my bike on purpose, <laughs> but they had coupons for bike share. Um, bike share. So I had no excuse. So I went on the ride. I actually really liked it. And then, and I don't know exactly how I met Nellie. I cannot figure out, I don't remember how we. I think we recruited you as a role model. Yes, but I don't know how. After. Okay, so they we, recruited we me like as a role model. sought you out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Maybe they did. laughs> oh, that makes sense. Okay, so they, all right. So then I became a role model, which are women who go out and get more women to ride. And I, all of my friends live somewhere else. So I said, well, the only, reason, the only way I know how to do this is to create a group. So I went on Meetup and I created Bicycling in yep. the City. And um, the first ride we did was, I think the picture you showed, we did a bike and paint, oh, one of those paint nights where you go and you paint a picture, you drink wine. So we did that first, <laughs> that's the one in the middle. Before you ride? You uh, drink the wine? No, no, we did the ride. <laughs> <laughs> you do the ride, you paint, drink wine, then you ride again. <laughs> And then we did bike and yoga. The art is in there, though. That's good. Okay. Yeah, there's bike and yoga. The last one is the last event I had. That actually wasn't a bike ride, but that was, um, it was part of the group. I did a, uh, a vision board party, and the bike group did that. That was part of what we did. So we, all of my rides are designed to be short. They're under 10 miles, and we always go to do something. Because the goal, my goal is to get women on the bike, and if they're riding to something for about four or five miles, they don't pay attention that they've ridden four or five miles, because they're gonna go do something, and then they do the thing, and then they turn around and come back, and they're like, oh, I just rode 10 miles, and they don't even really <laughs> right. realize it. So um, we do bike and kayak, bike and stand up paddle boarding, bike, um, bike in the movies, oh, bike and a... <laughs> So there's a lot of, there's bike, a lot of bike biking. Bike and kayak. Yeah, so this is the Baltimore trip we did. That was a great one. We got on the Mark train with our bikes. We rode out to Baltimore. We met up with um, Liz Cornish, who is the executive director at Bike More. She just found like 35 women somewhere. And we all <laughs> rode the, city, the streets of Baltimore, which was awesome. We went to the Harbor. We went to the Hamden Festival. Um, we went past the, just a whole lot of stuff. And then it's the bike and kayak. So. Um, so that's what, that's what my group is, and I'm on Meetup, Bicycling in the City. <laughs> and so this is, absolutely, and this is, 
something that unless you, this, there's a community in cycling that forms, and once you sort of, you know, it becomes like the onion. Once you connect to one person, you get connected to the next. You three have all been connected in some way, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But for those of you who maybe aren't aware, there are these group rides that are happening out there, and there are all these social networks for connecting to these group rides, and some of them are targeted to specific audience. I titled this Millennials and More. Um, and I'm going to sort of segue over a little bit over to um, Leah because what you're doing with DC Bike Party, and um, you can sort of talk about how that interacts with your day life or, or not. Sure. Um, but um, <laughs> it's, I, I see it as, and I experienced this in Philadelphia, is this is wonderful way, and the same thing with the rides that you all are doing, women bicycling or black women bike. Um, introducing the ride through the idea of having someone who's got your back. You know, you're riding with people who are experienced with the streets, um, and you're really creating, a, in your case, a social space, which is an alternative to going and hanging out and not being in motion. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to talk a little bit about DC Bike Party. And I'll embarrass you with a few photos, too. I couldn't find any good ones <laughs> to really get you. But. Those are embarrassing enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, no, it gets better. There's some naked rides. No, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, these are great. Yeah, so are great. DC Bike Party is um, a monthly group ride that I started back in July 2012. Um, it's by no means an, an original idea on my part. I grew up in San Jose, California, um, and that's where the first bike party um, happened, and their rides boast up to 5,000 riders, um, which you can do in San Jose when it's 75 and sunny every day. <laughs> um, so I wanted to bring a little bit of my hometown to DC. And that's what we did back in July and exponentially just kind of slowly but surely gained ridership. Um, and partnered up with Brightest Young Things. Um, partnered up with just about everybody. everybody. Yeah. I'm, I'm really proud to say that. We work with Funk Parade. We work with Capital Pride. Um, we work with various beer companies. Um, oh, here's the, uh, oops, wait. I lost this. Hold, hold. I love the posters that you do for these. They're fantastic. And, and they, they honor that tradition. Sue showed a few of the really amazing graphics around in illustrations about bicycling. But it, 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 yeah, the baby's <laughs> drinking a Pabst PBR. Um. <laughs> <laughs> this baby has also evolved with bike parties. So um, we're about to hit our four year anniversary. So expect a toddler. Um, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the rides themselves and the sort of atmosphere. Sure. So, you know, DC Bike Party is often noted as a little more party than bike. And um, Basically, we get as many people as we can together. Um, our goal is to ride through every quadrant um, as much as possible, although with um, a ride that sometimes gets over 1,000 people, we definitely have reduced the mileage um, that we ride. Um, but we really want to make it fun. It's a new theme every month, so anything from superheroes to Cherry Blossom Chase to our balloon anniversary where we wanted everybody to wear balloons on their bikes. We really just wanted to create something fun. So when people say, are you advocating for something? Are you, what are you protesting? And we often answer, we're protesting a lack of fun. So, <laughs> you know, the, and one thing I'm most proud of is the diversity of our ride from age to gender to race to class to are you a lawyer, are you a bike messenger? This group really brings everybody together. And both you and uh, Renee have marketing backgrounds, um, which I, in terms of looking at the, the posters, in terms of looking at social media, how do you figure out how to get this kind of thing off the ground? How do you insert it and in, in start to build that momentum? What? You don't think about it. You just do it. I started that group in November. No one rides in November. I didn't even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just went, oh, I'll just start this and people showed up. I don't, so I don't know that there was a whole lot of... Uh, after you get into it, then you think about it. You're like, oh, I should put some you know, structure around <laughs> this and maybe let people know. And, um, but I run it all through Meetup. And, but when I was, I worked with Nelly for a year mm -hmm. as the Women in Bicycles coordinator. So I had a lot more planning because I was being paid. So was, you had to think about <laughs> it more that way. But still, um, I thought about where people were in that space. I was talking to somebody on the ride. Like, I'm not a big, I like social media, but you have to figure out where people are. And I figured out, like, bikes, bike people are on Twitter. 
which I never, I didn't use in my business in pharmacy. Pharmacists aren't on Twitter is what I found out. So um, <laughs> who knew? So I used, I used a lot of Twitter and Instagram, and I used Facebook more in, the, in this part of the world because that's what people are on. So it's more thinking about that and where you're going to reach those people and then how you plan it from there. How do you get them back to wherever you want them to be so that they show up? I echo that. I yeah. think it can't be all that planned. Um, we definitely started with a few posters going up around town. Um, and then slowly but surely, after tweeting and Facebooking to no one over the course of a few months, slowly but surely, you get some followers and it snowballs. How mm. many, how, what would be your largest ride? Uh, I think our largest, excuse me, I'm having some mic issues. I think <laughs> our largest ride um, was probably our second annual Pride ride, and we had over 1,300 people on that ride. Wow. Um, so, and I distinctly remember standing wow. back. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, how do you, you know, how many of you, I can't see out there, but how many of you by clapping knew about DC Bike Party? Have you ever run into them? Okay, great. Um, you know, it's almost like by dark of night, you know, or a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, real quick, best group ride story. Want to go first? Best, group best ride. worst. I would say my my best group ride story. I think was the Baltimore one. That was <laughs> my favorite. I'd been planning that one for months. Once I heard the Mark train was taking um, bikes on there. So we planned that and then to meet up and, that's and then a big deal. to go yeah. around. And there were, as you saw, there were probably 40 or 50 women on that ride. I haven't gotten to 1,300, but that would freak me <laughs> out. Like 20, <laughs> 20 is like the perfect Wait, number Wait, let's go to back me. to how long have you been riding a bike? I learned to ride when I was 25. I'm 45 now. But that's I just said that pretty public, great. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so 20 years. And I learned to ride on a date. I didn't, I... I didn't want to go to a movie, and he asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, I want to learn how to ride a bike. So he took me down to Georgetown, we rode a bike, and he taught me how to ride a bike. But I want to push you on that and your story with your mother and how you... Uh, oh, how that all came about. Oh, that's what you were doing that for. Oh, my <laughs> <laughs> So after I did the, the thing with Black Woman Bike, um, my mom had a stroke in September, and she was at GW Hospital, and I don't know if you've ever been to GW Hospital, but the parking there is $22 a day, just in case you need to know that. I found that out. And I thought, I cannot come up here and visit my mom every day at $22 a day. So luckily, I had just been to Black Women Bikes Workshop. So I, th I told my mom, I said, I'm going to ride my bike up here to see you. I didn't know what that really entailed, but I mapped it. I was about eight miles each way, and I biked there every day to see her. So, um, and it was very therapeutic. It was good to, to kind of get out. I figured out a route that worked for me. And, and had um, you really biked around the city? I know, before? I had not, except for that one ride we did, I had right. not biked around the city. But I learned, because I went to that workshop, which actually kind of saved me. <laughs> and then, <laughs> it saved me a lot of money. And then it led to so many other things once I did it. I mean, that, that picture, that earlier picture you showed with me on the bike, that's a, that was taken, that was in Momentum Magazine, because I met them yeah, at the, I, um, at the bike summit last year, so they came out. They did an article on me, so it was. It led to so much. Just well, that momentum one day. is where I found you, actually. Oh, it, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, so it led to a lot. Just you know, doing that ride that I didn't want to go on. <laughs> and, and I think Sorry. the next bit of Renee's story. So she she started out as okay. I came to a, a workshop. Then she came to a class. Then she did this ride. She found this practical way or necessary way incorporating it into her life. She started volunteering, she turned into a role model, she started working for WABA, and now she gets paid to teach children how to bike yeah. for Bike Maryland. Yeah. So this uh, is like the oh. whole... <laughs> That's all happening in a year. <laughs> in a year. That's yeah. all happening in a year. <laughs> well, once, once you're in, it's addictive, but it's, yeah. there yes. is this, this space, and that's probably a good time to come over to you, Nellie, where you have to be brave or feel empowered, and let, that's all about you now. Um, let's talk about the role of Washington Area Bicyclist Association yeah. and how you helped to get women on bicycles. And Definitely. All of, and then we'll move over to Najima. Um, I want to spend probably 50% talking about WABA overall sure. and our work in the region and then women on bicycles. Yes. So raise your hand if you've been to Berlin or London or Copenhagen. Most people, right, wow, okay, uh, Ooh, shout out, what made those cities really bike friendly such that 25% of people are out riding on bikes? Temperance bike lanes. Bingo, yep, th I didn't even, yep. So Wava, he's from, <laughs> so 
We are trying to create an Amsterdam in the DC region. We represent DC and the surrounding counties. And what we need is this tried and true network that separates people, yeah. that's protected infrastructure. And that's back to what Lynn was talking about is those systems of control and how cities are designed. And we're still struggling in this country Absolutely. and in this city. Absolutely. And we're, our, our story is going to take a much different shape than cities like Copenhagen or, right. or Berlin because we our cities have are designed around cars. Right. Uh, so in the 60s and 70s, all of the public space was turned into public space for driving and for parking your cars. So our cities are a little bit more spread out, which means we're going to have to rely a lot more on how public transit seamlessly ties biking into our everyday <coughs> lives. And for a lot of folks, biking will never make sense, and that's quite all right. But they say that about 60% of people are the interested but concerned. That, oh yeah, I'd, I'd ride to the bank, I'd, I'd ride to the grocery store to visit my mother, um, but it's too long of a ride, I will get wet, I will, I will. Or they show. hop on with Leah for a fun thing, but maybe don't feel empowered to do it during the day. Yeah, yeah, the and getting or at or some Renee. of the social contracts on the road. As a woman, do I feel safe out there on the road at night? Mm -hmm. Do I feel safe out there just out in the middle of the road by myself? Um, just the other day, my neighbor, as I was leaving her house, she was like, um, will you will you call me when you get home just to make sure you got there? And I live two blocks away. I live in her neighborhood. So wow. we very much live in a society mm -hmm. where women are told that we are not safe out in public or right. safe taking up space. Mm -hmm. So very much redefining social contract in a very different way here. Um, but yeah, so WABA works and exists so that we are building out better infrastructure, better policy, better education programs and campaigns, better enforcement. So we're a staff of 16. We have 70,000 supporters in the region and 6,000 members. These are all people who believe in what we're doing, who want a safe place to ride, who want workshops and classes to go to. Um, we are out teaching four or five times a week, and we have four outreach programs. Um, there are probably 20 people in the audience who are involved by volunteering a night of week, or they are on our action committee volunteering 20 hours a week, or they are a decision maker, I saw one of you out there, who is actually shaping the streets I was going to say, city. so how do you feel that the advocacy, um, the impact of your advocacy efforts, how do you measure those? Definitely. Um, so back in 2000, well, let, let's take a further step back. So WABA started in 1972. We had some major advocacy wins in the, in the first 20 or 30 years but it has just started to skyrocket. So first advocacy win, people came together to say, hey, the sewer grates that are parallel with the streets, people are dying. People yeah. are falling, their wheels yeah, are getting yeah. stuck, they're getting hit by cars, they're dying. <coughs> Simple change, so we fixed that. Metro, they successfully lobbied pretty hard to get bikes on the Metro. Does anyone remember here in the room you had to get a registration badge to bring your bike on the Metro here? We lobbied to get that wow. out of the way. <laughs> um, lobbied to get folding bikes on the Metro, which folding bikes are the secret of all secrets. You can take them on the Metro oh, at yeah. all hours. Oh. Um, and, then, and then the, so the winds just keep piling up. So, so a big metric. Are there in your, uh, in our slides? In your um, slides? No, but there's some that? outside if you go check oh, out okay. the bike racks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's true. So yeah. a really important metric is number of miles of protected bike lanes. We have about 70 miles of bike lanes in the city. Any guesses on the number of protected bike lanes and mileage? Six miles, six miles? Yeah, seven, six. But in the next 25 years, the city has committed, based on your advocacy efforts on WABA's organizing, they have committed to 125 more miles of bike lanes, 72 of which will be protected infrastructure. That means there's a line of, tra oh. of cars parked protecting you, or bollards, right. um, the, the green mm -hmm. paint. So those are important metrics for us. Mm -hmm. um, crash rates, that's an important metric. Um, the, the, let's see. What's the most compelling thing that you can bring to the table when you are trying to push forward these policy changes? Is it the numbers of advocates and voices who, who weigh in? Mm -hmm. Or is it, uh, you know, this, the sort of the sad, the unfortunate side of things where we have accidents happening out there? I mean, what is it what that makes finally us tips the scale? Well, at the auto because industry. Because it can be used to the negative on the other side of it as well. Well, well, the auto industry brings in about nine trillion dollars, and we are boasting—we're <laughs> we, a powerful force out there. We'd like to think. 
Um, what, what is most compelling? Right. I, I think it is public space and our limits out there with congestion. DC, kid you not, ranked worse, well you know this, I'm, I'm not kidding you, <laughs> ranked worse in the country for congestion, the amount of time you spend in your car, the amount of time you spend idling and spending money on your car. Mm -hmm. um, for metro riders, we have an alternative, come to biking, <laughs> we will treat you with, <laughs> the, we will open yes. you with open the arms. Those yes. formerly <laughs> known as metro riders yeah. is what we're calling and ourselves now. And if you're going to stay on the metro, great, why not bike to it or from it? We can talk about folding bikes. Um, it's that seamless integration of all of the great resources we have for transit now. Um, obesity is another major metric that by 2020, half of the American population is going to be obese. Let's talk about normal ways of, of integrating acti activity into our lifestyles. Mm -hmm. I, I'm lucky, I, I am cheap and I am lazy, and that's why I bike, because I don't want to go to the gym. Do you want to tell me real quick, or is this a good way to... Oh, there's yeah, a, good segue. There's a couple of surprise slides in here. Segue into Women of Bicycles. Well, who's that? Oh. This is a darling gal who attended our, our coordinated Family biking event, the ABCs of family biking, a group called Kidical Mass organizes more parents to bring, and they, <laughs> they are the people who represent a safe bike environment, the people who are willing to bring their two-year-olds out, yeah, their absolutely. darling two-year-olds. Um, so we organized a workshop for parents. And then, um, oh, this is my buddy. <laughs> this, this is my buddy Colbert. Yeah, we ride all the time. We're best buds. <laughs> I think they made that Daisy song about the two of you. He sang it for you. Daisy, Daisy, bicycle for two. Yeah, uh, bike advocacy has brought me fortune and fame. I tell you, <laughs> I'm, I'm so lucky. So, um, I do want to highlight. Oh, will you go back? Uh, you can kind of see. Next slide. My tattoo on my chest, uh -huh. it is something, so talking about women in the arts, I designed my own bicycle tattoo of a bike heart. I won't show you now, it'd be a little too revealing, but oh. <laughs> <laughs> just showing my commitment to the work that we're all doing. And that, it is about commitment. There, once you're in it, there, it's a sickness in a good way. It's a passion. <laughs> it really, I'm, I'm a victim. I'm there. I, start, I got on a bicycle because of a boy. And that slide that I showed earlier was my very first time on a bicycle. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I know how to bike. Uh -huh. I'm terrified. And I, um, yes, so, but once you get in it, I now own three bicycles. I've got a vintage Schwinn. I've got a road bike. I got a, yeah. So let's talk about passion and commitment and talk a little bit, and also the health and, and maybe women in bicycles um, and your role, Najima, and the connection to WABA. And I pulled a few slides up. Sure. Talking about black women bike. Anywhere, start anywhere? Start anywhere. How, sure. did, it, how did it come about? All right, well, I, I know there was a Twitter involved. Yes, there was <laughs> there a Twitter involved. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Najima Washington. This is not a bike-related injury. Yay, I was worried. <laughs> just wanted to let you know, no, this was a planned surgery and unfortunately I'm hobbling around for a little bit. And I, as Nellie said, I'm eating into my bike time with the summer coming up and mm -hmm. nice weather. But um, Black Women Bikes started um, because a few different people were having different experiences around interest in advocacy and transportation and recreation. And there was, um, there was a conversation between two of our other co-founders, Nsei Ufat and Veronica Davis, who um, were just having a conversation about the fact that black women actually do bike, want to bike, enjoy biking, make it a regular part of their life. Um, Veronica is very uh, involved in the transportation space and in the advocacy space, so she's known around the city for that. She doesn't own a car. She's, she went carless at one point. Um, I still own a car, but I chose to commute uh, to work as a part of training for triathlons that I was doing around 2011, 2012. And around that time, um, Ensei was actually living with me and it became, she was like, well, let's get bikes. It's <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so um, it all just sort of kind of organically came together, representing three different types of, of, of interest in the bike world. I'm, I'm like, yeah, let's get fit. I'm trying to get fit, you know, and say wants to have a good time. And this is a, all a part of Veronica's work. So we literally were on Twitter one day and the hashtag evolved. And then we said, well, let's, I think I have here. yeah, let's take it beyond, let's take it beyond 2300 um, followers. Yeah. Let's take it beyond, uh, uh, just this conversation on Twitter and, and get out in the community and really show, um, other women, show children, um, 
that there are black women who have an interest in this particular uh, sport. So um, it, literally in, in one of our rides or in, in many of the rides that Veronica would have, she would express to us that people would point and say, hey mom, there's a black lady on a bike. And the fact that that was just so novel for people was alarming to us. Um, in like, this community, in I this read community, that, I read that quote. Right, quote. Um, she, she was living uh, in uh, or around Southeast mm -hmm. DC and then it sort of just became a passion for us to not only um, bring women, children, we have generations that come out to our, to our rides. We have mothers and grandmothers and daughters, grandmothers and grandkids, granddaughters that come out. And um, it's, it, it was important for us to really to promote that. We also work in the community uh, with, um, we've worked with uh, Edgewood, uh, a neighborhood in Washington, uh, you know, checking kids' bikes before school, um, and making sure this they have pedals, yeah, have he head um, helmets, and uh, making sure that everyone's educated to, to know what their rights are on the bike, how to be careful on the bike. We hold different types of clinics um, to make sure that people are knowledgeable and safe and they can um, be out on the, on the roads and really enjoy themselves. And we had an opportunity to, to partner with WABA and with Women in Bikes, and we've done that several times over the years, and it's mm -hmm. been very fruitful um, to be able to have you know, their level of expertise and knowledge and to support us uh, as an organization. Can you talk, Nellie, about specifically women in bicycles? Yeah, I kind of glossed over that tonight. <laughs> no, well, I mean, how, how can we? Everyone here is doing something in some way to empower women, whether, yeah. Lynn's, your work at the Middle East Institute, that's yeah, what, one of the things you're doing. Um, and how do, how do we empower women, more women to bike? I mean, um, I, I have a slide later we can show where we talk about uh, the American League of Bicyclists report that Women on a Roll, that was the name of the report, names the five C's of advocacy for increasing empowerment for women in cycling, comfort, confidence, community, consumer products, and convenience. And we're going to turn this question, this is going to be on every table at Sunday Supper, and over to you for your ideas for answering um, and a strategy and a solution for change under this. But maybe you can talk a little bit yeah. about... Yeah, definitely. Um, I just want to point out a few resources if, if folks are interested in learning more. Um, so Sue Macy's book, obviously. Sue, are you going to have this for sale out there? Oh, are we? Okay. Really? At a great. table oh, downstairs and, and you'll be signing. Oh, maybe. even a sign. I have oh, my really? sign copy right here. Um, I rely quite a bit on Women on Wheels by April Streeter. Ellie Blue is an author who talks quite a bit. She has a zine collection. One of my personal favorites for women called Saddle Sore, all about biking and the specific needs of, of of people like me. Who there are, are some tricks to the trade. There are some tips know. and tricks, yes. yes. Um, and then I, I created this workbook that we use in our Women in Bicycles program. Um, so, and I will flip through a little bit and I'll be concise because I'm sure that you're on We a, have four minutes. Okay, I'm on it. On it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, during my interview at WABA, I said, what are you all doing to get more women on bikes? And my boss says, well, it kind of depends. And I found out afterward that one of his organizational goals was to set up a women's program. And one of my goals in joining the organization was to set up a women's program. So we connected a few dots and worked with folks at the national level who were interested in setting up a women's program. Excellent. And it just was this collision of all of these incredible, powerful forces at one point in time. Um, Black Women Bike DC had just formed at that time too. So this conversation had just launched. And the reasons that we, observed and that research has started to show is that less women are biking for four reasons. Um, the first reason is fear, so that women are more socialized to be concerned about their, their settings mm -hmm. and that we are taught that the public space out there is, is a little bit more dangerous for us. Mm -hmm. I say hogwash. I think men feel similar concerns too. I, I, for me, it is not about intimidation. The second one is about social constraints. Um, they say like, okay, Women are expected to show up to functions and not be glistening and to look prim and proper and to go put their makeup on and Hair look nice. Kind of like, yeah. I'm not one of those people. Some of those people are. I mean, I can totally see that. What my favorite quote but here is. But in Copenhagen, they bike in heels. We've seen the pictures. Yeah, <laughs> we, we all look at bike in heels. Like we saw <laughs> uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Ellie Blue. Uh, she says, it's not because we're fearful in vain, it's because we're busy and broke and our transportation <laughs> system isn't set, us, 
isn't set up for us to do anything but drive. So, yeah. mm -hmm. money, we're talking about money, mm -hmm. women are much more likely to not have as much of it. Mm -hmm. Time, women are likely to be doing more trips. Um, you, you mentioned a chauffeur s system. It, it's not the same system here in, in the United States. The chauffeur system for, for women who are mothers is that they're doing the majority of household trips. And multitasking. And multitasking, to, so trip chaining, they're, they're going to pick up kids from school and then soccer and then grocery store, which is a lot more difficult on a bicycle. So the, those are the, the main barriers that we've identified. And we thought, okay, well, we can't really address those systemic issues. But what we can do is get more infrastructure, get the infrastructure that makes people feel more safe, build a community that demands this better infrastructure. So the Women in Bicycles program is like a pipeline for engagement. So we pulled together all the gals who already bike um, in the last four years. It's grown to 4,700 women, which is incredible. Wow. And then we just push people into different points on the engagement ladder. So, I mean, Renee was a perfect example. But the more women that we get involved as volunteers, as organizers, uh, in positions of power, and the more- Black women like DC as well. Yep, yeah. um, and the more women we get involved at bicycle meetings where we're talking about bikes who are testifying or running for election, the more that we're talking about biking in this certain lens for these specific reasons. Fantastic. So how do you get involved with women in bicycles? That's a great question. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, if you are a Facebook person, you find us on Facebook. Just search women and sign bicycles. We do a monthly ride, a monthly workshop, a monthly meetup. And we're hiring. We're hiring for new coordinator because Renee left us for, for her She's fortune. She's building things. bikes with kids <laughs> in Maryland. Uh-huh. Um, and yes, we... The empire. <laughs> and then for WABA, we are, we are always looking for more people to get involved. Um, come, come instruct with us sign a petition, get involved in an issue you, that you care about, which is more often than not an issue that's in your neighborhood. Uh, join an action committee. I see some action committee folks in the crowd. Do Those you need to be a cyclist to be able to get involved? I don't know what that question means. Yes, no, no. That, you, but that's the thing, is so, so that the, getting past the intimidation, we haven't gone on a ride with Renee or Najina yes. or Leah. Um, we, we have a I learn have to ride class cold. that Perfect. we do twice a week. So if you've never learned how to ride a bike, good luck. There's 900 people on our wait list. Come, <laughs> no, come, come check us out. Uh, there's an 89% success rate. Come to our city cycling classes. That's all about maneuvering an urban setting on two wheels. Uh, and then get involved with these community groups to find out what those tips and tricks are. Perfect. I think that is a perfect four minute closure. Um, I wanna, because I wanna thank you all. And this is about empowering, championing women through the arts is, is what we're committed to doing. But it is about championing women to be empowered, to feel independent, to feel like they can get anywhere they wanna go and, um, and be healthy and, and have joy on two wheels. So I'm going to um, thank a lot of our fantastic folks and donors and you as well for being here and um, this is what we're gonna do next we're gonna go off to Sunday supper um, and uh, talk about it and get to hear back from all of you in the audience um, thank you to our fantastic lady here. and to Sue